Hey everyone, this is Dr. Ryan here. If you're new to Mental Dental, welcome to the channel. I made a video about this very topic, basic dental terminology, about two years ago, and I've gotten a ton of feedback from it. So now I'm making an updated video. You might be a dental student, a pre-dental student, a dental hygiene student, a dental patient, but wherever you are in your dental journey, welcome to this video and I sincerely hope that you learn a lot about the field. So with that, let's talk about dental terms used every day in the field of dentistry. So first, let's get oriented with the mouth. Of course, we have the lips here that form the outer border of the mouth. We have the teeth, we have the tongue, we have the roof of the mouth, which is also called the palate, which is divided into a hard palate which is towards the front of the mouth and has underlying bone, and the soft palate, which is towards the back of the mouth and includes this hanging bit of soft tissue called the uvula. The tonsils are also in the back of the mouth and they serve as part of the immune system. Now we've separated the teeth from the previous diagram and the patient is open as wide as possible and we have the upper teeth up here and the lower teeth down here. And note how the teeth form an arc or an arch like you'd see in certain architecture. So we call this one the upper arch or the maxillary arch because the upper jaw that holds these teeth is called the maxilla. And we call this one the lower arch or the mandibular arch because the lower jaw that holds these teeth is called the mandible. Now we all have four different kinds of teeth. The first kind are called the incisors. We have four incisors in the front of the mouth for the maxillary arch and also four incisors down here in the front for the mandibular arch. There are two central incisors and two lateral incisors in each arch. These are used for incising or slicing food like when we bite into an apple, for instance. Of course, the four upper incisors also play a big role in how our smile looks, and they help with speech like F and V sounds, for example. The canines are next, and we have two of them in the upper arch, right next door to the incisors, and we also have two in the lower arch. They're also called the eye teeth because they're located in line with your eyes. They're used for tearing and holding food and also contribute to the aesthetics of someone's smile in the case of the upper canines. The premolars are next and we have both a first and a second premolar in each quadrant of the mouth. So we have two premolars here, two premolars here, and then we have two and two down here. And again we have a first and a second premolar in every quadrant of the mouth. They're used for tearing, holding, and grinding food. And lastly, we have the molars. So we have three molars in each quadrant of the mouth. We have a first, a second, and a third molar. The third molars are also called the wisdom teeth, and they're the most commonly missing tooth in the mouth. Molars are used for grinding and mashing food. I should mention that these are the adult teeth. So let's talk about the baby teeth. The baby teeth, also called the primary dentition, are shown here. And we have 20 of them in total. We have 20 baby teeth when all of them come in. There are four incisors per arch, two canines per arch, and four molars per arch. Note that there are no premolars in the baby teeth. These start coming in at around six months of age and teeth coming into the mouth is called eruption. And all of the baby teeth should have fallen out by at around age 12. Teeth falling out of the mouth is called exfoliation. Over on the right, we have the adult teeth, also called the permanent dentition. We have 32 of them in total. Of course, some people have extra and some people have missing teeth. 
these teeth start to erupt at around age six, and then hopefully they never exfoliate as long as our teeth remain healthy. All right, so I told you there are 32 adult teeth, but how do we number them? Well, there are three main numbering systems that dental professionals use today, depending on where you live in the world. The FDI system is used in most places in the world, just like the metric system. The universal numbering system is used in the United States, and the Palmer notation is used in certain specialties, particularly orthodontics and oral surgery. And I'll tell you why in just a second. Now let's start with the universal system first. And it's just like reading a book. You start in the top left corner, which is this tooth right here. And then you go from left to right. So I wanna point out really quick that this side is the patient's right side and this is their left side. Because remember, we're looking at the patient straight on. So tooth number one is right here, and that's the upper right third molar. Then we just go in order from there. Tooth number two, number three, number four, and so on. So we'd go around the upper arch until we got to this tooth over here, which is the upper left third molar, or tooth number 16. After that, we jump down to the lower arch, and that lower left third molar is tooth number 17, and then we continue numbering here, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, keep going, all the way around to the lower right third molar, which is tooth number 32. So the upper right third molar is always tooth number one, the upper right central incisor is always tooth number eight, and so every tooth has a predetermined number from one to 32. For the Palmer notation, we break the mouth into four distinct quadrants. The vertical line straight down the center of the mouth is called the midline. This horizontal line is simply separating the maxilla and the mandible. The Palmer notation is a little bit different in that we don't go above the number eight because each quadrant has eight teeth. We start at the midline and work our way out. So the central incisors are always tooth number one, the lateral incisor is always going to be tooth number two, canine will be three, first premolar will be four, second premolar will be five, then first molar, second molar, and third molar. And that's true for every quadrant in the mouth. So we could do this for every single quadrant. Now you might be wondering, well, how do we distinguish between the ones, the twos, and all the other teeth among the different quadrants? Well, notice how the lines intersect. So this corner forms a backwards L, this corner forms a normal L, this one forms an upside down L, and then this one over here is an upside down reverse L. So every quadrant gets a unique symbol. So now all you have to do is take the symbol for that quadrant and then assign a number based on the tooth we're talking about. So if we're talking about this upper right central incisor, we would just put a one within the symbol. If we're talking about this upper left canine, we would put a three among this symbol. If we're talking about this first premolar in this quadrant, we would just add a four. And then down here in the lower right, if we're talking about, let's say the second molar, we would just put a seven in that symbol. So an oral surgeon might get a referral from the orthodontist to extract the upper and lower fours. And that means the first premolars. Now, that's a whole lot easier than saying, please extract tooth number five, number 12, number 21, and number 28. So you can see how the symmetry and the simplicity of this system might be preferred by orthodontists and oral surgeons, for example. And lastly, we have the FDI World Dental Federation System, which uses two digits. The first digit tells you the quadrant that you're in. The upper right is quadrant number one, upper left is quadrant number two, lower left is quadrant number three, and lower right is quadrant number four. Now the second digit is the exact same as the Palmer notation, one through eight one being central incisor, 
8 being third molar. So now instead of using the symbols here, we just use a number. So for the upper right central incisor, we would call this tooth number 11. The first one for the quadrant, the second one for the number. Let's pick this lower left second premolar. This would be tooth number 35. And so you could do this for every quadrant of the mouth using that method. So if you're curious, this is how we number the primary dentition or the baby teeth. For the universal system, instead of using numbers, we use letters. So instead of number 1 to 20, because there are 20 baby teeth, we use letter A through J. And the order of notation is otherwise the same. So we would start with A in the top right, and then we would continue B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Then we would jump down here to tooth K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T. Now for the Palmer system, we also replace the numbers with letters. So instead of one to five, because there are now five teeth in each quadrant, it's A to E. And we use the exact same quadrant symbols that we used before. For FDI, it's a little bit different. We still use two digits, but for primary teeth, the quadrants are five, six, seven, and eight, instead of one, two, three, four. The second digit would just go from one to five, like in the Palmer system. So those are the three most common tooth numbering systems. So next time you visit your dentist, you can impress them by pointing out a certain tooth and its number. So now let's talk about the tooth surfaces. So a tooth consists of both a crown and a root. The crown is the part above the gums, the root is the part buried below the gums. The crown of the tooth has different surfaces on it. Just like a cube has six surfaces, so does the tooth's crown. There's a front and a back, a left and a right, and a top and a bottom. And every surface has a name except for the bottom because it's connected directly to the root underneath. So the front of the tooth is called the facial surface. If we look at our diagram over here on the left, this would be the facial surface for tooth number three. This would be the facial surface for tooth number eight. And this is the surface of the tooth closest to the face, hence why it's called the facial surface. Interestingly, there are other names that can be used to describe this surface depending on where you are in the mouth. So if you're talking about a front tooth or an anterior tooth, that refers to the incisors as well as the canines, this facial surface can also be called the labial surface. And that's because it's adjacent to the lips. If you're talking about the back teeth or the posterior teeth that includes the premolars and the molars, the facial surface can also be called the buccal surface, which is another name for the cheeks because those surfaces are adjacent to the cheeks. The back surface of the tooth is called the lingual surface. And on the diagram, this would be the lingual surface for this tooth, and this would be the lingual surface for this tooth. Now this is the surface of the tooth closest to the tongue, hence why it's called lingual. In the upper arch, we can also give this a different name. We can call it the palatal surface because it's adjacent to the palate, which is the roof of the mouth up here. The side of the tooth that's closest to the midline is called the mesial surface, M for midline. So for tooth number three, this would be the mesial surface. Tooth number eight, this would be the mesial surface. Of course, all of this is true for the lower arch as well. Next is the distal surface. That's opposite from mesial. It's the one that's furthest away from the midline. So for tooth number three, this would be the distal surface. Tooth number eight, this would be the distal surface. And you can imagine that 
everything would be kind of a mirror image to the side across from it. So this would be the distal surface for tooth number nine. This would be the distal surface for tooth number 14, for instance. And lastly, we have the chewing surface. This is called the occlusal surface, which comes from the word occlusion, which refers to the upper and lower teeth coming together. Now in the anterior region, this is given a different name. This is called the incisal surface. That's true for the incisors as well as the canines. In the posterior teeth, these biting surfaces are all the occlusal surfaces. All right, so teeth also have different layers. We've probably all heard of the enamel layer, and that's the hard, calcium-rich surface of each tooth. Enamel is actually the hardest tissue in the human body. Dentin is the surface underneath the enamel, and it makes up the bulk of these roots here. Notice how there's no enamel in the root structure. Dentin is a little bit softer and more yellow colored than the enamel because it has more organic material. Pulp is the soft tissue inside each tooth, and it contains blood vessels as well as nerves. The pulp chamber is the part that's in the crown, and the pulp canal is the part that occupies the root. The gums are the reddish pink tissue that surrounds each tooth. It's kind of like the skin around your fingernails and toenails. It can be also called the gingiva. The bone that is underneath the gums and houses and holds each tooth in place by the roots is called the alveolar bone. The alveolar bone is part of each jawbone that we talked about briefly before. The upper jawbone is called the maxilla. The lower jawbone is called the mandible. The cementum refers to the thin, hard tissue that covers the root of each tooth. Now this tissue has similar density to bone. And lastly, we have the periodontal ligament which is this tissue right here. It's between the cementum and the alveolar bone. Now we have lots of ligaments in our body and they usually connect one bone to another bone. But in this case, with the periodontal ligament, it connects a tooth, which is not technically a bone, to the alveolar bone. Tooth decay is the result of germs in our mouth, specifically oral bacteria. The bacteria feeds on sugars in our diet, and then they process this sugar to produce acid. The acid melts away the mineral content in our enamel, and then our dentin. It starts out small and unnoticeable, but then can grow to produce these big holes and cavities. The loss of mineral of the tooth due to the byproducts of bacteria is called caries, which comes from the Latin cariosis, which means full of decay. Gum disease is the other main disease process that occurs in our mouths. Plaque refers to a collection of bacteria on the tooth surface, also called biofilm. If this plaque is not removed by mechanical brushing and flossing, the bacteria can not only melt away our tooth structure like in caries, but can also anger our gum tissue, which is called inflammation, which can make them red, swollen, and even painful. Gingivitis is an early form of gum disease where the gums become inflamed, so they're red, swollen, and can bleed easily. Again, it's usually caused by plaque buildup near the gum tissue. If this plaque stays around for a long period of time, the situation can get even worse. And then we get to what's called periodontitis, which is a more severe infection of the gums. It involves not only gingival inflammation, but the gums and the bone that supports the teeth can retreat and recede away from the plaque. When severe or chronic, teeth can loosen over time and even fall out if enough bone is lost. So the difference is gingivitis is reversible, 
while periodontitis is irreversible. The names of each also explain exactly what they are. Itis means inflammation, so gingivitis means inflammation of the gums, and periodontitis means inflammation of the tissues that surround the tooth. Now let's go over some specific terminology for dental treatment. So restoration refers to any kind of treatment that repairs or replaces teeth. So this can include fillings that replace decayed or missing tooth structure, but this also includes some bigger procedures like crowns and bridges that we'll talk about in a little bit. So amalgam is a dental filling material made up of a mixture of different metals, such as mercury, silver, tin, and copper. It's also known as a silver filling. Composite is a tooth colored filling material used to repair or cosmetically enhance teeth that's made of several types of resin-based plastic substances. Bonding is another term that some dentists may use, and it refers to the process by which a tooth-colored filling material is attached to the tooth. A sealant is a thin plastic resin coating that can be placed on the biting surfaces of back teeth to help prevent caries from forming within the pits and fissures of these teeth. A crown is the top part of a natural tooth that's covered with enamel, but it's also the name for a filling that covers the entire natural crown when the tooth has broken down and can't be fixed by a smaller amalgam or composite filling. Crowns can be ceramic to match tooth color, or they can be gold metal like this crown here. A bridge is an appliance that is cemented in place, just like a crown, but it replaces missing teeth. So if this tooth was completely missing, for example, the bridge would cover the adjacent teeth, and then a fake tooth would be placed in this empty space to replace the missing tooth and bridge the gap there. Another way to replace a missing tooth or teeth is with a denture. So this is something that's taken in and out by the patient and can be a partial denture like this one to replace some missing teeth, or it can be a complete denture if all of the teeth of that arch are missing. An implant is another option for replacing a missing tooth, and it's a device that's inserted into the jawbone to replace a missing tooth and hold a crown or a bridge or even anchor a denture in place. An extraction is the removal of all or part of a tooth. So here we see a root canal treatment. So everyone has root canals, but only those with deep enough decay or trauma require a root canal treatment. This refers to a treatment that removes the tooth nerve or the pulp tissue, and it seals the space with a biologically stable material. A crown is usually recommended to cover a back tooth when it gets a root canal treatment to prevent it from breaking down. A veneer is a thin artificial cover for a tooth to correct its shape or color. Veneers can be made of ceramic, composite, or acrylic resin. Scaling is a procedure that uses instruments to remove plaque, tartar, and stains from teeth, and root planing refers to the cleaning of a tooth root to remove bacteria, calculus, and diseased cementum surfaces. So a general dentist can provide the treatments we just talked about, but there are specialists who receive specialized training for dealing with more complex cases. There are more specialties being added every year, but as of recording this video in 2020, there are 12 ADA-recognized dental specialties. Dental anesthesiologists are specially trained to provide pain management during dental procedures, particularly things like intravenous deep sedation and general anesthesia. Dental public health specialists focus on advocating for dental and oral health issues at the community level, things like water fluoridation. Endodontists treat problems of the tooth nerve or pulp, 
or infections in the bone associated with infected nerves with procedures such as root canal treatments. Oral medicine doctors diagnose and manage patients with disorders of the face and mouth and provide biopsies, medical management, and specialized injections. Oral pathologists specialize in the research, identification, and management of oral disease. Oral radiologists specialize in the production and interpretation of dental x-rays. Oral surgeons perform tooth extractions, trauma surgery, corrective jaw surgery, and implant placements. Orofacial pain specialists are specially trained to diagnose and manage head and neck pain like headaches, migraines, and jaw pain. Orthodontists correct the position of teeth with braces and other appliances. Pediatric dentists specialize in treating children and patients with special health care needs. Periodontists specialize in treating the periodontal tissues that surround the teeth. So this includes the gums, the periodontal ligament, bone, and even the cementum. And prosthodontists replace missing teeth with crowns, bridges, dentures, and the restoration of implants. These artificial teeth replacements are known as prostheses, hence the name prosthodontist. And lastly, there are a few more miscellaneous terms that I'd like to review listed here in alphabetical order. First, we have abrasion. This refers to wear on a tooth, usually caused by brushing too hard or using a toothpaste that's too abrasive. This is what it can look like if you scrub back and forth too hard with your toothbrush. A band refers to a metal ring placed around a tooth with cement as part of orthodontic treatment. A bite wing is an x-ray of the crowns of the upper and lower molars and premolars. It's the most common x-ray taken at a routine exam. Bruxism refers to an unconscious habit of grinding or clenching the teeth, which often happens when a person is sleeping or stressed out during the day. Calculus or tartar refers to a hard deposit of minerals coated with plaque that can build up on the teeth and cause the gums to get inflamed. The most common place for it to accumulate is the lingual surfaces of the lower incisors. And this is the stuff that's scraped off when a dentist cleans your teeth. A cusp is one of the pointed parts on the top of a tooth. A premolar can also be called a bicuspid because it has two cusp tips. Dry socket refers to this phenomenon of pain and inflammation in a tooth socket after the tooth is removed, and that happens if the blood clot is lost. So if the blood clot is dislodged and displaced from the socket, it leaves the bone and the nerve endings exposed, which is what causes the pain. Erosion refers to the loss or wear of enamel by acids not caused by bacteria. So this includes things like soda, fruit juice, and stomach acid in the case of acid reflux. An impacted tooth refers to a tooth that's blocked from erupting through the gums on time. And this could be caused by another tooth, bone, or soft tissue. A malocclusion refers to when the upper and lower teeth aren't lined up well in order to bite and chew properly. Again, just the word occlusion, like we talked about before, refers to the contact between the upper and lower teeth. An occlusal guard is a removable device that a person wears over their teeth. A mouth guard is used to protect them from damage during sports and other activities, and a night guard is used to protect them from bruxism during sleep. A periodontal pocket is a deep area between a tooth and gum. That's the result of gum disease. So this is what dentists often measure in millimeters during a routine exam when they call out numbers like 1, 3, 4, for instance. A retainer is a removable device that's worn in the mouth to prevent teeth from moving out of position. It's often used after orthodontic treatment or premature loss of teeth. 
Sublingual refers to any area under the tongue. There are lots of salivary glands that produce saliva in this area of the mouth. TMJ stands for temporomandibular joint. This is a joint that connects the lower jaw to the skull. Now TMD stands for temporomandibular joint dysfunction. So everyone has a TMJ, two in fact, one on the right and one on the left, but not everyone has TMD. This refers to pain, clicking, popping, and other symptoms that are caused by problems with the temporomandibular joint and the associated muscles. And lastly, xerostomia is a fancy word for dry mouth. This can be caused by salivary glands that don't work properly or reduced flow of saliva from certain medications. And that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you learned a lot about dentistry and that you enjoyed the video. If you did, please like this video and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting me and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. I'll leave a link in the description below. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.